Do you want me to do a quick intro, Moya? Yes, you can do a okay. quick intro. Moya is actually one of our CIT teachers and she's one of um, an innovator and a leader with online learning. So she's been using online learning for quite a while now and she's going to um, give you a demonstration about how she's using um, video and things to actually enhance her classes. Good luck, Moya. Thank you. And uh, nice to see you out there. I'm going to talk, I'm going to try a flipped classroom this semester. I've told, set them the homework yesterday. Ask me about 12 weeks time whether it's going to work. So I'm going to reflect on what I think are the possibilities, the problems and a couple of solutions that I've thought of to help me through the problems that I perceive. Now, the flipped classroom is not a new idea. Anybody who had pre-reading at university or had to do the pre-lab exercise or had to um, do the problems before they went to a tutorial knows about the flipped classroom. <laughs> you do the content first and then you get the value out of the, the teacher. And you all probably, if you went to university, know how there was a bit of a problem with that. What's new about the flipped classroom? Well, my interpretation of the new way is that we're hoping that new technology will make it a bit more inspiring, that watching a video might be a bit more engaging than reading that pre-tutorial discussion paper. Now that's an assumption. I'll come back to that and look at a little bit of evidence, perhaps for or against it later on. I would like to make a distinction that is a slightly different interpretation to Penny's. I see a difference between flexible learning and a flipped classroom. Now flexible learning is the description of the automotive where they can access content, whether it's reading or audiovisual, and they come into a classroom and the stage ones are doing this, the stage three is doing that, stage four is doing that. If Sally, Fred and Mary were all told to watch the video and Sally and Fred did, they'll keep working on and Mary will have to watch the video before she progresses. That's flexible learning. If one of them doesn't get the content, that's not going to inhibit the learning of the other students. Now, I see the flipped classroom as where, as slightly different, I would like them to go and get that content and then I want to move forward with a group as a collective group. So I would like them to have the content and then I want to bring them back together again and move on. And I think you can all see the major problem that I feel is going to be my challenge. What am I going to do with the ones who have done their homework? I want to have content delivered pre-class, but I want to move on as a class with some sort of activity. Now you can see the problems we're going to have. If we're dealing with younger students, they are going to be disengaged, they won't know what's happening, their behaviour is going to deteriorate. With our older vet and university students, well their behaviour can be an equal problem, they won't be <laughs> flying aeroplanes, but they'll drive you nuts by asking questions and you'll be going through the material <coughs> again because they will continually interrupt you with questions or you might bite the bullet and say, you should have done that and you go ahead and they'll be left behind, which again is pretty distressing if you're a, a teacher who likes control as I do. So the big issue for me, with the, and, and this is the challenge that I'm facing, I want them to do the content beforehand but I want to have something that pulls them together so that I can move on in class. And this is how I'm going to uh, attempt it. Now, I've just skipped something in my PowerPoint, so let me see if I can go back. I can't. Okay. Right, no? Oh. So, this is my challenge, all right? They are here. We'll keep going. What I want to do is optimise the learning by moving on. I do not want to be in the position of saying, watch the video the night before and then coming into the class and saying, well, I'll just summarise what you should have done. Because I think that is a waste of time and it's going to turn off the motivated students. So I need to be able to reward those learners who have actually done the video. Right? I want to motivate the ones who haven't. Now, if intellectual stimulation is not enough to get my students to watch the video the night before, Really the only lever I have is assessment. So do I set some assessment with that video? But that means marking. So that one doesn't grab me. And if I want to get a fairly philosophically positive thing, I really need to move on. So how am I going to cope with those learners who haven't 
done, the content, how am I going to give them enough so that they can effectively use the rest of my lesson? I have a three hour lesson. What I would really like is to be able to assume that they've got that content and move on with the discussion or the prep or whatever else I wanted to do. So, this is the way I'm going to try it. Students are going to ask to watch the video or I, will, I do have notes. So if they don't want my video, they can watch notes. And then I'm going to start my class with an interactive quiz. Now, the interactive quiz bits we've got, and some, I know some of you in the room have seen it, it's a, a bizzo like that which goes into the computer and each of the students gets one of these little keypads which have numbers. Now in my class I've got, you won't see them, but I'll tell you, I've got these huge symbols on the back so at the start of the year Fred knows that he's the butterfly and Mary knows that she's the frog and as they come in they grab the, the responding device. The way it's set up is you set it up with PowerPoint, it's an add-on into PowerPoint. So I click on my PowerPoint, there's a question. The way it works in my classes, it is accessible but we're very relaxed. So the students will sort of will talk to each other. If they have no idea at all, I'll give them a few hints. They will frantically press their clickers. You can change the answer until I sort of close the polling. We then get a little bit of a graph which says what they have chosen. This is fabulous feedback. If everybody gets it right, we quickly zip on to the next question. If it's very scattered, it's a great conversation starter. I'll find the students will start talking to each other. You know, why did you say that? Uh, you're off your head, Sam, or whatever. I, if, if that was the answer, I would know that I had a really big problem because that actually most of them have got a very silly answer there. But it gives me feedback. Then we'll we get the right answer, there are two right answers there and we would discuss that. At the end of the session there are scores. So I have done an exercise, at the end of the session I have got some scores of what, they, what, I, what they've answered. Now what I see this offering me that complements the concept of doing the content at home, the boring listen to the lecture at home, it's a new activity. So I am not reteaching the stuff they were supposed to have done. For those who have done the, the viewing or the reading, it's going to refresh it. It's going to get it out of the long-term memory into the short-term memory, a really positive learning strategy. They've looked at it, they've got to remember it, they might have to synthesize, use a bit of what they've done, and they'll get good marks because they'll get the answers right. For those who haven't done a pre-reading, they're going to get the answers wrong. Now, I use clickers all the time. I've been using them for three years. They are a really powerful learning device in my classes. So I usually lecture and then we do clickers for half an hour. I evaluate my subjects and one of the questions is, what's the best thing about your, this class? 30 to 40 percent of every class say the clickers are the best part of the class. They learn, they talk, they talk about physics. I'm a physics teacher if you haven't picked that up. So I have have something that really starts, stimulates conversation in my class. So not getting it right, most of my students are young men, they don't like not getting it right. So the motivation to have done the work so that they do get it right is quite strong and they lose marks. Me, I'm a hierarchical learner. I like to be given the content, I like to be given some exercises, preferably starting with the easy ones, building me up to the hard ones so I never get out of my comfort zone and I like to get good marks. But some of my young men prefer to jump right in, guess, hack their way through, they don't mind if they make mistakes and they actually would prefer to learn by guessing and seeing whether they're right or wrong. So I'm actually giving them a couple of styles, like we've got the, the, the sort of typical student can do the work properly but some of these other learners can actually participate. And what happens at the end of my half hour? I have covered the content again. So I've now brought my class back together again. And I feel that I'll be able to go on. Now I do clickers anyway, so I'm saving the lecture time and I'm using that as a productive exercise. And I see that as coping with challenge number one of the flexible classroom. Now I'm supposed to look at Margaret and see how much longer I've got. About five minutes to go. Okay, the second challenge of the flexible classroom is how the hell do you make these videos in a reasonable time frame? I have about four different techniques for making videos. I do use them a lot. And I'll zip through them very quickly. The first technique I use is the digital pen. The digital pens are a wonderful little thing. It 
plugs into the USB, it's this thing you can see. This is a receiver that clips onto a pad of paper. The pen has a little transmitter. When I push down on the pen, it turns the electrics on. The receiver receives the infrared signal and it picks up what I write on the page. I link that in with a microphone and a screen capture program. So I write on the page, I talk, and it picks up what I do and what I say. Now, I need to go like this. I need to go here. And we need to look at uh, this one here. That's for 600 engineers. Uh, week eight. So this is my WebCT. This is WebCT. <coughs> Sorry. This is my eLearn course. Uh, so I use this technique for things like answers. So they've had homework. I just hand it back. If they want to see how to do the problem, they look it up on the web, and this is the thing that, that comes out. So we've got a triangular sheet. It's got a thickness of a triangle of thickness. It's got a total height H, and it's going to have a total width along here of capital L. Now the formula we've got, we've got two. We've got the mass times the radius to the centre of mass equals the integral along the length of the thing of R dn. Now where R is actually the so distance, you can see that I'm just told you. Okay. Now, the advantage of that is it's real time. I'm going to write out those answers anyway. I'm sitting at my desk, I don't get up, I grab a digital pen, grab the pen, stick it. Very quick. A bit rough and ready. They like those. I get a lot of feedback. They, they, you can't understand the problem. You can't work out how I've gone from line four to line five. Then you can go and listen to me talking through the solution. While we're here, I'll look at another type of video I make. This is the in-class recording. I use a smart board, I stick a microphone around my neck, I hit screen capture program, and they get everything that I say and everything that I write on the board. Now these are dodgy. They have my coughs, my splutters, it goes quiet when I walk out of the room. Real time, um, all sorts of things, so it's just looking. So it's just the screen. My voice is there somewhere. Let's click into it. The toilet is not bright because it's real time. So you can, that's enough. You can see, I, I, there, there I am now, I'm writing. <laughs> Hear me thumping around? They really like these too. Even though they're very poor quality, they can actually go back and see everything that I've done during the class. So that, yeah, I think I can, oh no, you can't see that. have to close that. I'll just shut down the boss. So that's method two, where am I up to? Method two, where it's an in-class recording with the smart board and the microphone. Method three, oh, so time, real time. It takes quite a while, they're very long, they're about an hour long. Uh, it takes a long time for the computer to churn out the video after I save the recording, but I don't have to mind it. So I would say, Uh, it takes me about 15 minutes to turn the, the clips on, put it up on eLearn. So that's a very quick one. This is probably the, the best quality is where I get the pictures, I write a script, and I sit there and present it, and I'll show you that one very quickly. This is the one I'm proud of. But the time, three minute video can take me, um, no, I've got to go back there. Oh, I want that one, sorry. A three minute video can take me four hours to do it this way, so, <laughs> you know, is it worth it? No, wrong subject. Let's find another subject here. We're going to go down here, this one. But this is my good one, so I do want to show you this. No method is that. No problem is not quite true. And it can come into it exactly. If you count every time a bird lands on a particular tree on a particular day, you will get. So 
we can see that I've really thought about the graphics, I've got a script, there's a lot of editing, there are some little cartoon things in it. I put a lot of effort into producing that video. But, and I've used it, it's about eight years old now, I use it every year, but it was about four hours for about a three minute video. I don't know if any of you are trying to make good videos, but that's about the time it took me to produce them. And the last one, which I won't show you because I'm, I'm running fairly short of time, is the same as the in-class video, but there are no students. So I get my notes and my pictures all ready, I put my microphone on, and I talk to the whiteboard with no students behind me and I capture it. It looks pretty much like the uh, class video, but it hasn't got the pauses, it hasn't got the bumps and the clattering in it. So there are four different ways. That one, I made a half hour video in about two hours. That's the one I use for my, my flipped classroom. So different, the ways I make it, the longer I spend making it, the better quality video. I'm going to go with the talking to an empty classroom. So what I'm going to do is prepare the stuff beforehand, put the microphone on, talk at the smart board but not have students. And I think I can get it down to about two times the running time of the video, two to three times the running time of the video is what it's going to take me. I've got very little time left, but I would like to just make two more points. I want to go back to this um, assumption that audiovisual material is more appealing than text material. Are our students going to watch the videos rather than read the notes? Now, I uh, teach, as I say, I evaluate every subject. The one that I'm going to talk about is a subject, it's one of the very academic, it's about first year university standard physics, and we have an excellent textbook. In fact, somebody had the brilliance to choose a really good textbook and write the syllabus around the textbook, which is a technique I think we should use more often. But it's really simple. I open the text, well, we don't teach from it, but I teach parallel to it. So there is an excellent resource. It's the university textbook used in the United States. So it's got no errors, it's got really interesting examples, it's really beautifully presented. I can get them for $15 on second hand from the US. There's copies in the library, very easy to get hold of. And as I say, I follow it. I, I teach parallel to it. I don't teach from it, but parallel to it. And they have my videos, the ones that you saw, with all the bangs and crashes and the dodgy sound levels and me fucking around on the screen. <coughs> At the end of that class, I evaluated and I asked them to give me feedback on their use of the textbook and their use of the videos. And this is what they said. <laughs> Excellent textbook. Excellent. It's, it's, and crappy videos. That's what we got. Okay. The last quote, last my last slide, is a direct quote from a student. Now this is about five years ago when I was first experimenting with our online classroom. It uh, was Vet Virtual then, but it's the equivalent to Limba that we've got now. And I'm pretty much a control freak. So to begin with, I was in my room and they were all down in the library and I'd run up and down and make sure they were doing what they're supposed to be doing. <laughs> After that, so I taught my first few classes with my students only a couple of rooms away. However, after that we did a, had a debrief and I was talking to the students and they were giving me feedback about what they thought of what I was doing and how they felt about the class. And it was an audiovisual presentation. And this is a quote which I often dig up because I think it is a really powerful quote that we should remember. This was a direct quote from a student and I'll leave it with you then. So, I think my email address is on the handout. If anybody wants to contact me and find out more about what I do, you're very, very welcome. Thank you.